If I were to ask you which one of the apostles you identify with the most, I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of us would probably most identify with the apostle Peter. How, how many would probably say they identify with Peter? All right, I, I kind of figured that, and, and it's easy to understand why. All right, because Peter is a lot like us. All right, he was impetuous, and by that I mean, remember the time when Jesus was walking on the water, and uh, they were all afraid, and Jesus said, "His eye," and he says, "Well, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out and walk there with you." And Jesus says, "Come," and what's he do? He gets out of the boat. I mean, he does, that's, to me, that's impetuous. And then, you know, I mean, it just kind of seems a little bit on the crazy side almost. I mean, getting out of the end of when the storm's going and he's out there on the But it was faith. But it's still somewhat impetuous. I mean, we're somewhat not like that. He's a man who often stuck his foot in his mouth. Okay. How many of us have been there before? Remember when Jesus is coming around and washing everybody's feet? What does he do? He gets up and goes, You will never wash my feet. Right? And Jesus says, I don't wash your feet, and you I have nothing to do with you. <laughs> that changed his tune real fast, didn't it? All right? And he was even sometimes less than courageous. Remember the night Jesus was arrested? And Peter's following along, and he's out there in the courtyard, and somebody says, Hey, you're one of them, aren't you? Nope, not me. Three times he denies Jesus. And probably most of us have been there sometime in our life too. We deny Jesus. Either by our words, but I'm feeling more often by our actions. Or sometimes by our lack of words. But Peter is also a great example of how, of how Jesus can take imperfect people and use them to grow his kingdom. Remember on the day of Pentecost? Peter gets up. The one who was afraid to speak out earlier, remember? Now he gets up in front of the whole large crowd and he starts speaking the gospel for the first time. And it says 3,000 people were added on that day to the family of God. And it was also Peter who later on went to Cornelius' house. Cornelius, a Roman centurion, a Gentile. And Peter goes there. And again, speaks the gospel to the Gentiles and brings the first non-Jews into the family of God. So today we're going to begin a series of messages from 1 Peter. Now Peter is writing to Christians who have scattered all over the area. All right? They've get scattered from, Rome, uh, from, sorry, from Jerusalem, uh, probably because of the persecution that was going there. So he's writing to some of them, but also to the other Christians who are there uh, because of Paul's missionary journeys and so forth. And so he's writing to all these people, especially those in the area of Turkey. And so when you read these pla places that we're going to read here in a moment, these are in the area of Turkey today. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of understanding there. Now it was written sometime between 60 and 66 A.D., Okay. We know it was written after the time of Ephesians, because he mentions some things that are in the book of Ephesians, I think, of Paul. But then it's also before 66, because we're pretty sure that's about the time that he died. Something is probably before 64 AD, because that was when Rome was on fire, and the really heavy persecution of Christians began. But at this time, Nero is the emperor of Rome. And Nero didn't like Christians, and he persecuted them. And the persecution of Christians was deadly. Peter himself, according to tradition, is later killed by Nero. Now, we've all heard it, you know, that he was crucified upside down. Not so sure about that, but we do know that he was killed by Nero in Rome somewhere around 66 AD. And so Peter is writing to Christians in this letter, to encourage them as they, fierce, as they face fierce persecution. And it seems that he's writing from Rome, because in the fifth chapter, he refers to being in Babylon, which often was a code name for Rome. So it's very possible he was writing from Rome at that time. Now, Peter was given his name 
by Jesus. His real name was actually Simon. Okay? But Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means rock. Okay? Now, it's not a really huge, like, bedrock type thing. It's more of a large stone. And I think that's key because, remember, earlier he said, when Jesus, uh, after Peter had said the, that, uh, when Jesus asked who he was, he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you are Peter, all right, the rock. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Some people get that confused. They think that when it says rock and rock, Peter, meaning rock, it's the same rock as later on, but it's not. Peter is a small, small rock. The other word is Petra, and it means like bedrock. Okay, so there's a little bit of difference there. But the thing is, he calls him rock. Something that is strong and steady. And so, we are looking at 1 Peter, and in a sense, this is hearing the rock speak. And that's what we're going to call this, the rock speaks. And we're going to be looking at his words to these Christians, and we're going to see how they apply to us today. Because he was writing to a, a different group of people at a different time, but I do believe they are relevant to us. That we need them now today just as much as ever. And so we're going to look at that. And today we're just going to kind of get into the beginning of it and kind of a little bit of an introduction and to see what he has to say. And so we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. And here's what it says. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling by His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now Peter says that he is writing to the elect. Elect has the meaning of chosen. Uh, about a month or so ago, I was uh, asked to come and be part of a focus group up in Northern Kentucky. Uh, we were going to come, and it was going to be an all-day thing. We are going to listen to some different things and make decisions and talk about what we thought about it and, and everything. And I was kind of interested in it, kind of one of those things I thought, well, this would be kind of fun to do. And so I get up, and I go up to Northern Kentucky that morning. And I uh, get there and have to sign in and everything. Oh, by the way, it was going to pay me two hundred and something dollars. That's yeah. really why I was interested. <laughs> but anyhow, so I get up there and uh, we're sitting there and uh, they had donuts and coffee, and so we're sitting there drinking. And so all of a sudden, this guy comes out, and one of the things they were doing was they were going to draw out names to get a fifty dollar, just fifty dollars in cash. Well, of course, my name wasn't called. <laughs> But then he says, now if I call your name, I want you to go get your stuff and, and go over in the room next door. Okay? And so he starts calling out names. I'm waiting for my name. I'm waiting for my name. And after a while, there's just four of us sitting there. He says, well, I've got good and bad news for you all. He goes, we've got enough now, people, for our thing. We don't, we don't really need you. So you get your day free. So you get your day back. And you'll still get paid. Now, we didn't pay $250, but we got paid, I got paid about $150 for about an hour's worth of my time. You know, a couple hours, actually, for driving and everything. But I was really disappointed. I wasn't one of the elect. All right? I wasn't one of the chosen. I wasn't one of the ones who got to go into that other room and be a part of that. And it, it kind of kind of hurt for a little bit. Now, after a while, I got thinking, well, at least I do have my day back and I can get stuff done that I need to get done. All right? But I was a little bit disappointed. You know? We want to be chosen. You know? When we're, they're picking teams, you know, when you're in school, you always want to be chosen. You didn't want to be the last one either. But it's even worse if you didn't get chosen at all. And we all want to be chosen. And the good news is that you can be chosen to be one of God's elect. You can be chosen to be one of God's elect. When he's talking about the elect, you can be one of those people. And so here's what I want us to see. We are chosen when we choose Christ. 
See, that's the thing. How do we get to be chosen by God? It's real simple. We choose Christ. Now, some people get really kind of confused on this because it says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. All right? To the foreknowledge of God the Father. In other words, they kind of get the idea that, oh, so God has already chosen who's going to be the elect. He's already chosen who is going to be saved. And there are some people who really believe that. They believe that God is just, in some way or another, whether it's random or I don't know what way for sure, He's chosen certain people that are going to be saved, and the rest of us are just out of luck. If we're not one of those elect, we're out of luck. But that's not what the Scripture teaches. Look what it says here in Ephesians 1, 11. It says this, In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Now, See that idea of predestined there again is that idea of, of something happening that, you know, is, is it's already decided. But I want you to notice what it says there. It's not the person. He says, who are predestined, what? According to the plan. Get that? So the ones he chooses are the ones who have been chosen because they have gone with the plan. And what is the plan? Well, Here's a verse that most of us are familiar with. John 3.16. It says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, you see the plan here? Here is the plan. The plan is that God sends his son Jesus Christ to die for us and that whoever believes in him will be saved. Get that word, whoever. All right? That gives us the idea that it's everyone who chooses. Isn't it? It's not a certain select little group, but it's anybody who chooses Jesus Christ will not perish, but will have eternal life. Now, one thing that needs to be understood, though, when we say that word, believe, Okay, when we talk about belief, some people just means, think that means, well, if I just acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, then that's it. All right? No, it's not what it says. It says who believes in Him. In other words, when we put our complete trust in Him for our salvation, our complete trust, that means we are willing to do whatever He says. We're going to submit ourselves to His will and follow Him and do what He asks us to do. That's putting our trust in Him. We have to believe in Him. But that's the plan. And so if we choose to believe in Christ, if we choose to follow Him, then it says that God chooses us. So we are chosen when we choose Christ. But we are chosen then through the sanctifying work of of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Now, that word sanctifying is one of those big church words, you know, that we all look at and go, okay, I'm not really sure what that means, okay? And basically what it means is to set us apart, to make us holy. So the point is, like what we were talking about earlier today, is that He wants to change us. He wants to mold us into the image of His Son. That's what He desires. 2 Corinthians 3.18, this is from the New Living Translation, says this, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. You get that? It says the Lord, who is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is in us when we have accepted Christ Jesus, when we have given our life to Him, when we have been buried with Him in baptism, when we receive that, He makes us more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, we sing that song, Just As I Am. And that's a great song for invitation because that's right, God does accept us as we are. We don't have to change to be accepted by God at first. Right? He wants us to come to Him just the way we are. We don't have to get up, make ourselves better 
before we come to Him. However, once we have come to Him, He expects us to change. And He does that not by us, but by His Spirit working in us. The Holy Spirit does a couple things in us. Number one, He guarantees our inheritance. He guarantees that we are God's people. So when God looks down and He's deciding who's going to go to heaven, guess what? He's looking for people who have the Holy Spirit in them. That's how He knows His people. That's the mark that says we are His. But He also brings fruit in our lives. He enables us to live our life in a way that is different than what we lived before. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But there's a bunch of them there. And you know what? The, it's not like we can pick and choose those. Those should all be evidence in our life. If the Holy Spirit's in us, these are things that should be seen by others. And I think not just in a natural way. I think in a way that goes beyond us. We should have a joy that is inexplicable, that nobody else can understand because it comes from the Spirit. We should be able to love others in a way that we could not without the Holy Spirit. We should be able to love our enemies, to love our neighbors, to love God in a way we never could before because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We should have kindness, unlike anybody else in the world because, well, any other people who aren't in Christ, because the Holy Spirit is in us. We should be able to see that fruit in us. It should be a change in us from what we were to what we are now. And we should continually see that. And we should continue to grow and be more and more and more like Jesus as we go along. Notice what it says? It said there again in that, in that verse. It makes us more and more like Him. Are you becoming more like Jesus? You're chosen through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. As He works in you, God is choosing. And then we are chosen for forgiveness and for obedience. You know what He said there? He says, just read it again, He says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and strengthening by His blood. You know, Hebrews tells us in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You see, in the Old Testament times, each year blood was taken into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. Now the mercy seat was that place between the two angels on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And they would take blood and they would sprinkle it there to purify the people for another year. But you see, Jesus' blood is worth more than that of rams and bulls. And so his blood cleanses those who accept him forever. We are clean forever as long as we are in him, as long as we don't deny him. And so we are forgiven. So we are changed because we've been forgiven. And we are chosen for forgiveness. God has accepted us and forgiven us, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. But we are also then to be obedient to God. Just as Jesus was obedient to God the Father, we who are being made into His image must do the same. We've got to be obedient. You remember Jesus, when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before He died, remember what He said? He said, Father, if there's any way, take this cup away from me. Meaning, his death. His the torture he was going to go through. He said, if there's any way, take it away from me. But then he said this, but not my will, but your will. In other words, I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to do what you desire, Father. Even though I know what it's going to take me to. Even though I know what I'm going to have to go through, I'm still going to follow you. It's all about you, Father. And you see, we've got to do the same thing. We need to put ourselves underneath God's will. 
And we need to be willing to go wherever God takes us to. To go through whatever God takes us through. And to understand that He's working for our good. That in all things, He'll work together for our good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Those that you meet, you can call according to His purpose. And so it's a sign that we love Him. John 14, 23, Jesus said this. He said, All who love me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. My Father and I will come to them and live with them. Get that? All who love me will what? obey my teachings. So if we love God, guess what we're going to do? If we love Jesus, guess what we're going to do? We're going to obey His teachings. It's not going to be a matter of whether we want to or not. It's going to be because we know we need to. Because we know that, first of all, that God is trustworthy. That when He asks us to do something, there is a reason for it. So you know, I, I coach middle school football. And uh, sadly, last night we lost in our round of playoffs. Now we lost 25 to 26. Oh, One wow. <clears throat> but it's interesting. Sometimes I have to tell boys over and over again how to do something. And I tell them, do it this way. And... They go ahead and do it their way. And guess what? It cost us. All right? Because they didn't do it the way that we told them to do it. Not just because our way, we think we're smarter than they are. But we are. But, anyway, so. <laughs> but, but because we know. We know from experience. This is going to help you out. This is going to be the best way to do things. And it's the same way with God. He does the same thing. He doesn't tell us just to... to impose his will upon us and do, make us do what he wants to do so we can be his puppets. He does it for our benefit. When he tells us not to do things, it's because that's the best thing for us. When he tells us to do things, it's because it's the best thing for us. He knows. He's the maker. He made us. He knows what's best for us. And yet too often we try to do our own way. To do our own thing. And when we do, it causes problems. And Satan gets the victory. So we, we are chosen then to be for forgiveness and for obedience. Alice Cooper read a song where he sang these words. I want to be elected. I don't know how many of you remember that old song. But I want to be elected, he said, and, you know, I want God to elect me, all right? And I figure you do too. You want to be part of the elect. You want, when it says, when Peter says, to God's elect, strangers in this world, you want that to be you. At least I hope you do. And so if we want to be chosen by God, we need to know what it means. You know? We want to be chosen by God because we also know what not being elected means. You know, just like me, in that day I was left out. I didn't get to be a part of the group. I didn't get all the rewards that that group got. I was left out. The thing is, if we're not part of God's elect, we're left out. Remember what it said? It says that those who believe in Christ won't perish, but will have eternal life. Guess what? If you are, you don't believe in Jesus. If you haven't given yourself to Him, if you haven't trusted Him for your salvation, guess what? You're left out. And you won't get the rewards. You won't get that eternal life that He has promised. But He wants it for you. He wants to choose you. But you've got to first choose Him. We can be chosen. We can be part of the elect by choosing the Son. By choosing Jesus Christ. In Christ, we are the elect. Just one more sing our song of commitment. And uh, when we sing this song, I want you to think about your life. The song we're singing is Blessed Assurance. Are you assured? 
your salvation? If you're in Christ, you are. If you've accepted Him and are living your life for Him, you're chosen. You're elected. If you haven't, you need to do something about that. And so we ask you to come forward. We ask you to talk to us. Find out what you need to do. How can you accept Christ? How can you choose Christ? What do you need to do? How do we, how do we go about that? Because then He will choose you. Let's stand and let's sing. You got something else you need?